Hi there, I'm John Spriggs, sometimes known as John the Nice Guy, and I'm going to be doing some simple walkthroughs, uh, some sort of the sort of thing that you'd hope to see from a mentor kind of person uh, who you're sitting alongside or sitting over the shoulder of and watching how they get started with something. Now, that's not to say that the things I'm going to show you are going to be the world's best or the most efficient way of doing things, uh, but these are how I get started with things, and I'm going to show you some of the tools that I use, and uh, I'm going to sort of try and get you into an environment where you're building a very simple uh, Ansible and InSpec environment using Vagrant, which is a VirtualBox tool. Sorry, it's a tool that manipulates VirtualBox. Um, but yeah, so um, as I said, um, I'm John Spriggs. Uh, this is me. Hello. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today, today um, about some of the tools that I use. Um, I use um, a combination of VirtualBox uh, and Ansible um, to try and uh, build a set of environments that I use uh, for some of the things that I do. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different pieces, bits of pieces that I use. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, VirtualBox and Vagrant. Uh, I'm going to show you how I use those commands. I'm going to show you some of the files that you use to manipulate how those environments work. And then I'm going to kind of show you what that looks like when it's all done. So uh, the very first thing that I am going to do is I'm going to open up a terminal. So I've already installed uh, Vagrant, uh, which you get from vagrantup.com, uh, and VirtualBox, which you get from virtualbox.org. Uh, um, and these two tools are, um, well, all three of these tools I'm going to show you are cross-platform. Uh, so they work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Code. Um, which is a, an IDE, an integrated development environment. Uh, and uh, again, they're all cross-platform. Um, Ansible, which is one of the tools we're going to be using, can only really be run from uh, a Linux environment. So either Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows 10 uh, or a Linux machine, or you can run it on a Mac as well. Um, uh, VirtualBox uh, doesn't really like being run under Hyper-V. So if you are using a Windows 10 machine, uh, which is running Hyper-V, then there are some workarounds that you're gonna need to uh, go out there and find for yourself. I don't use um, Hyper-V on my machines, so it's up to you how you want to go with it. So anyway, so I've got Visual Studio Code. I've got a couple of extensions installed. Uh, I've got Ansible, uh, Inspect, and Vagrant file, uh, but I'm not really gonna focus too much on those. Those are more for to see in color some of the, some of the statements we're gonna be working with. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new terminal. And the reason why we create, we're opening up this terminal is to execute the very first command. Uh, so uh, I have uh, opened Visual Studio Code. I've created a folder called Screencast001. So all the files that I create from now on are going to be in here. So the very first command I'm going to issue is going to be vagrant init standing for initialize, initialize. Um, and then I'm going to do uh, Ubuntu Bionic 64. So um, I like using Ubuntu based systems. Um, this system I'm even running here is an, uh, a, a version of Ubuntu called Ubuntu Mate. Um, and um, Ubuntu has a server flavor. Uh, so that's the Ubuntu part there. Uh, and then the next important part is this Bionic. So Bionic is the code name of the current long-term support release, uh, which is sometimes known as 1804. Uh, there's long-term support releases uh, every two years from Canonical, the company make, that makes Ubuntu. Um, so it was 1204, 1404, 1604, 1804. And in fact, uh, as you can see up here, this is uh, February the 28th of 2020. Uh, so in April, that's the 04 part of the 2004, um, that uh, the next release is going to come out. I think it's called something like Fervent or something like that. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll find out shortly. Um, but once uh, a release goes from being in development, where it's got these funky code names, Bionic and things like that, um, it will typically move to being the uh, year, year, dot, month, month format of releases um, but for some reason the cloud images always stick with the code names don't know why so that's the bionic part so that was um bionic was the 
release release name for 1804 and 64 is because I'm working with a 64-bit system so I'm going to run this init command so the first thing that this does um, is it actually creates a vagrant file up here um, and actually one of the things that I want to try and do is actually um, start to be a little bit sensible about using version control so I haven't mentioned that I'm going to be doing that but I'm going to do git init so what that does is that also adds um, although you can't see it here a hidden directory called dot git so I'm going to do git add vagrant file you can do things like this uh, add command with with the git into with the visual studio code interface but I'm not going to do that now I'm going to do git commit minus m uh, added initial favorite file so oh let's just pop that up there for a second so this has said ha huh. um, this committer um, your name and email address were configured automatically well, that's not right so we're gonna need to fix that so it actually even tells you how to fix this so git config global edit so we're going to edit that file and we're going to say that my name is, it's not Ubuntu, it's John Spriggs and my email address, I don't know why it's edited, oh, I don't know why it's edited in that, but, and it's going to say my email address is john at sprig.js. Uh, so now I'm going to do git commit amend reset author. So, git log. Ha! Ah, we've got we've added our initial vagrant file. Fantastic. So now what we need to do is have a look at that vagrant file. Now, this is going to look super scary. There's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of lines in here. In fact, this bit here is like a map of all of the different lines in that file. But the really important thing to note is that most of them are green, uh, and they've got this hash or pound or octal thorpe symbol at the beginning, and that means that it's a comment. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove quite a lot of these comment lines um, because you don't really need them. So let's take this out and this and that. In fact, let's get rid of that one as well. So yeah, I'm going to get rid of loads and loads of this. I'm going to leave that line there in and that's it. Okay, so we've gone from ginormous file with loads and loads of stuff in um, down to just a couple of lines. Uh, and so if I now do a um, vagrant up command, that's going to run the vagrant command in the background. It's going to um, download the box file. So a box file is just a, a virtual image that it's downloading from this point on the internet. Um, and the reason why I'm using the Ubuntu Bionic is because Ubuntu is one of the uh, most common uh, virtual machine server virtual machine images that are on the internet at the moment. Um, so I'm using this Ubuntu image. Uh, it's added the box to my local repository with this date on it. So if you notice, 2020.02.27, pretty close to today. Uh, so that's actually a box file that was in it was um, created on that day. Now it doesn't mean it's got all the patches and stuff rolled into it, it just means it's been re-imaged on that day. And the reason why it's done that is because it's reset internal passwords. So let's talk a little bit about security of Vagrant whilst we're waiting for this to come up. So when Vagrant first started, um, all of the images shipped with a single um, username, Vagrant, and a single password, Vagrant, and a well-known public key pair, public private key pair. All this sounds pretty normal so far. The problem is that public and private key pair, because it was being shipped with the software, everyone had to know what it was. Downside to that means that everyone knows what the password is for your machine, uh, which was great when everything was just running on local machines. But as soon as people started using these virtual machines for cloud stuff uh, or exposing those machines to the internet using SSH forwarding and things like that, it meant these machines turned up on the internet and people were suddenly able to get straight into these development machines. Not too great. So what the people at Vagrant decided to do was, um, and you'll see it in a second when it comes up, is um, they have a standard username and password 
which is vagrant and vagrant. So when you SSH into a vagrant machine uh, and then try and do any user commands, if you see the username vagrant, password's going to be vagrant. Um, they generate a new private key um, and inject it into the machine. And you'll see that running up there in a second. Now, difference with the Ubuntu images is that Ubuntu um, builds their vagrant files, their vagrant box files rather, from the Ubuntu cloud images that they also ship to people like um, AWS and Azure and people like that. Uh, so the downside to that is it means that they can't have that same vagrant vagrant username and password because people are using these in production cloud. So instead what they do is they create a username of Ubuntu and a password of a long string. Uh, previous iterations of the Ubuntu vagrant uh, box files used to store that password in the box file that they ship to you. Uh, what they now do instead is they have the Ubuntu image but Ubuntu cloud image, and then they inject into it this vagrant, vagrant username and password and the um, private key. Um, so, as I said, when it boots, it will reset the, pi the private public, it will create new public private keys for the vagrant user and then transfer those outside the, va outside the vagrant. So in fact, actually, if you look up here in vagrant machines, um, it should in a few moments actually show you the public key that it's created. Now actually what you will notice as well, so we've got this .vagrant directory here. We've also got a log file. This is a little bit annoying with this vagrant image, but it's, it's fine. So this is um, the boot logs, so that you can actually drill into it and find out what's happened there. Haha, here we go, vagrant insecure key detected. So what it's doing is it's gonna replace that, that key with a new key pair, and then transfer that key pair here, there we go. So there's that private key. So if you ever need to SSH into your Vagrant machine, uh, what will actually happen is uh, Vagrant actually provides that key pair to you. So, and in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do Vagrant SSH just to show you that I can connect into that virtual machine. And I mentioned before that Vagrant is uh, a tool that manipulates VirtualBox. So whilst that's just loading there, I'm just gonna pop open VirtualBox. Um, and look, there we go, there's our virtual machine here. Um, and what you'll notice is it's got this really big username here. So it's screencast001, well that's the directory name we were in before. And then default, which is the name of all the default machines in Vagrant. And then this is a long date timestamp thingy that it generates per build. We don't really need to look at that, but what you, it does mean you can do is if you really wanted to, you could go in and you could actually access that running machine but we're not gonna do that right now. So let's close that down. That's still running there. And excellent, we have our virtual box. Excellent, so let's come out of that. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do git add vagrant file. Uh, and I want to see what I've made, what the differences are I've made. So I can do git diff vagrant file cached, because I've just added it to the, um, uh, the source control tree. Uh, for those of you who don't know how git works, um, git, is all done locally on your machine until you tell it to push to somewhere else. Um, you've got the current working tree, um, which is um, what you're working in. And then um, you add files to a staging area. So this is this git add here. So what I can do is I can have a look at what the differences are between what's in the head, uh, the current working tree, uh, and this staging area. So let's have a quick look at that. Oh, wrong way around. Git diff cached. So we can see that all we've done here is we just corrupt a whole load of this file out. Excellent. So git commit. Well, actually, what I'll do as well is I'm just going to shrink that down for a moment and I'm going to drop into uh, this git tree here. And you can see we've got this staged file here. And if I click on that, you can see here as well all the stuff we've cut out. So depending on whether you're more used to working in a terminal or in an editor, you can decide whether you want to do your commits here or do it from the command line. Personally, I prefer to do all of my commits in the terminal just because you are a bit less likely to make errors in the terminal. I don't know why, but that's just how it is. So I'm gonna do git, not git, git commit. This opens up an editor and I'm gonna say uh, removed unnecessary comments from vagrant file, excellent. 
Uh, all of these lines that have got the hash symbols there, they're actually removed from um, the commit log. So when we do uh, X, control X to exit, and then we're gonna write that, it's written that to a file. So look, this tree, source control tree there has gone away. But actually, I don't want it to be tracking these .vagrant file and this Ubuntu image. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an echo dot vagrant output to dot get ignore. So that's actually taken that dot away from there. And I'm gonna say echo uh, Ubuntu bionic star dot log uh, to the end of dot get ignore. Uh, but look, so we've got one file here, this this .get ignore file, and if you look there, you see that .get ignore file there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stage that change there. So I'm going to see what it's got there. Oh, I added these two lines, fab, and I'm going to say uh, added a .get ignore file uh, with vagrant and boot logs, and then we click the tick to commit. Fantastic, so if we do down here, we do get status, we can see that our working tree is clean and we've got nothing to commit, fantastic. So, so far, so good. We've got a vagrant file, it boots, we know it boots, let's just get rid of that. So we do vagrant destroy minus F and it goes away, poof. Well, I say poof. Uh, so if we just pop back open Oh, no, we haven't got time to do that, it's already gone. Um, so, what have we done? We've created that Vagrant file, we've booted it. This is great, um, but I didn't like the host name that we had inside the virtual machine, and I didn't like the fact it was called to default, both here and also in VirtualBox. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a couple of changes to this box file, uh, just so that we've got a proper name for it. So. Um, I'm going to, in here, type config.vm.define. And what this does is this says, uh, I want you to um, mark everything else after this point as being related to a separate machine. Uh, so I'm gonna do sc01, because this is gonna be screencast01, do pipe sc01. Um, you might sometimes see that as bar or something like that. And I'm then gonna do end, just so that I don't forget to close that block. And I'm gonna do sc01.vm.host name equals sc01. And I'm gonna say, by the way, sc01.vm.pro, no, provider. Ah, it's already auto completed that for me. Uh, virtual box. In fact, I could have just copied that part there from this. In fact, I will actually do that. Um, so interesting part about this is that actually anything that starts in this block here that starts um, SC01, um, you could actually take this line out of here and you can dump this up here. Uh, instead, so it's instead of saying that, I could have instead said config. Now, what happens if you do that? Well, it means that all of the virtual machines you create in this vagrant file will all be called SC01, which probably isn't a problem um, uh, for when you've got just one machine. But some of the boxes that I try and create later on uh, might have two, three, five, or even 10 in some cases, virtual machines. Now that means your um, the host that you're, build, you're building this stuff on needs to have quite a lot of grunt, so it needs to be able to work with quite a lot of storage. But if you're working on, say, for example, a server that's got Vagrant running on it, um, you've probably got the, the capacity to do that. So what we've said is that we want um, to create a machine. So whereas before this one here, at this level, it would have been called default. So anything created under that level there would be default. So I've said SC01, uh, can you please name yourself SC01? And by the way, I also want to do ask VirtualBox. So that's the VB name equals SC01. So we've now got this naming stuff here. So if I do vagrant up, um, and whilst that's loading, I'm just going to open up VirtualBox. So now we see that whereas before, 
uh, it said SCO1. Uh, it said uh, default rather, up there somewhere. Now it's saying SCO1. Uh, and it's going to go away. And very interesting. Come on. So every time you start a virtual machine up with Vagrant, uh, it, what it does is it copies the disk file uh, to a point in the file system, uh, and it then imports that disk file into VirtualBox um, as a new virtual machine. Uh, and there's a whole load of stuff around in the background of how that stuff works. Um, but so what we should see in there in a moment Interesting. Why do we have two machines there? I am tempted. To exit VirtualBox and go back into it and see if that makes a difference, because it shouldn't have had two machines there. There we go, just one. So this is now called SCO1. Fantastic. The host name there is SCO1. And what if we look down here, pop that back up, pop that across there. It's doing all the same stuff it was before, but now it's actually, um, when it said it was, it's, it's booting the machine. So we've got to wait for it to finish coming up, but that's fine. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. Ba -dum, ba -dum. So this is taking some time. So there are some things that we can actually do in the background here to try and improve the speed somewhat of this. Um, so let's just pop that back down there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this block here back up to here. No, I'm gonna wait for it to finish booting first. Whilst I'm waiting for it to boot, I'll show you this. Uh, so the standard Ubuntu virtual machines uh, have two CPUs and one gig of RAM, which is fairly similar to most cloud sort of smallest machines that you can get. Um, I think uh, AWS will give you half a gig of RAM rather than a gig of RAM as their very smallest machine uh, with one CPU. So this is a little bit over the spec of what AWS's smallest machine is, but it's a fairly, fairly reasonable basic machine to work with. Have another look back there. I'll tell you what I will do whilst that's doing. I'm going to add, start adding some comments to this uh, so we can use that when we do a git commit in a second. So what I'm gonna say is that um, this defines the box image we're going to use. And then um, this defines uh, the name of the um, the name that Vagrant knows this machine as. This defines what the virtual machine knows itself as. And then this is, um, here we set some options for VirtualBox. This defines the um, what virtual box knows this machine as. So the reason why we've got three separate places for names here uh, is because Vagrant knows machines. So if we do Vagrant status, now this is finished booting, which is nice. Uh, it says it's called SCO1, fab. VirtualBox, as we've already seen, knows this as SCO1. And if I do Vagrant SSH, bum, bum, bum. this is where it knows itself as SCO1. Fantastic. So if I was to change um, this line here to be AA01, and that AA01, and then these AA01, and then this one BB01, 
and this one as CCO1, um, you'd have those different names in different places there. Um, if you call this, um, this part here is the name that Vagrant knows it as. So you could leave this as um, VM. So then we'd have VM and VM, which is fine. So you could use this as to sort of replicate lots of different bits and pieces. Um, but that just overly complicates things to me. So what we've got here is if we set them all as the same name, then they'll all be set as the same name. Makes sense. So we'll come out of that and we'll do get status. So we can see that vagrant file has changed. Get diff vagrant file. In fact, let's just do get different. Get diff. So get diff. What this does is it just asks get to tell me all the things that have changed in this machine. Oh, we haven't saved that file yet. So let's just hit save there. And if we do get diff now, we see we've got comments. Uh, so we can say get commit minus m uh, added comments and set vm name for vbox virtual box vagrant and vm oh get add vagrant file and get commit fantastic so if we do get lock now we can see all of these commits that we've made. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail as to what all these different bits and pieces are, but we can see here that here we've added this commit. That's in fact actually, so we'll do get log minus p, and you can see at each of these stages what's changed. And you can do q to quit anytime you see it saying that colon at the bottom there. Just drops you back to the part there. Right, so, so we now have a virtual machine with a host name. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run some extra things to speed things up in the future. So we're going to copy this line here from the dot up to here. And we're going to say config.vm provider. And we're going to say vb. linked clone equals true. So this basically means if you're uh, destroying and rebuilding your virtual machines on a regular basis, um, then um, it can just import that initial base image once and reuse it multiple times. So if we were defining two machines or five machines, we just have one based base box machine and lots of subsequent ones. The other thing that I'm going to do as well is so I'm going to add a comment there. I'm going to say. Um, this defines virtual box changes to apply to all VMs. This asks virtual box to um, use linked clones instead of importing box files each time. Fab. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, Vagrant to use a thing called uh, a plugin called Vagrant Cashier. Now, when I tried to run this yesterday, uh, it didn't work very well. But we're going to give it a shot. So we're going to say has plugin Vagrant Cashier. So end again, and then we say config dot cache.scope equals box. So, uh, check to see if Vagrant has the cache here plugin. If so, ask it to retain all the package caches at a box. Right, so let's quickly explain what that means. Um, so Vagrant Cashier uh, is a plugin for Vagrant uh, that when you when you install packages, software into um, Ubuntu-based virtual machines, um, it um, downloads the package files uh, 
from a repository, a, pack, a place where you can find all these different packages, um, an apt repository or a Debian, uh, Debian repository, uh, sorry, a Deb repository. Um, and it retains those in a cache location on the machine. So what that means is when you then go to do apt install, um, it first checks in the cache and then checks on the repository. Uh, so it will check the repository to see if the, the version that's on the cache is the latest one. And if it is, it'll install that one. So what cache here does is it actually mounts uh, into your virtual machine a copy of that cache directory. So it just speeds things up, which is better for these screencasts anyway. So let's do uh, vagrant destroy. If we do vagrant destroy minus F, that means force. So it basically just stops it from asking the question, which I think we saw before when I did vagrant destroy and it asked me for a name. It asked me if I wanted to shut it down. So I'm now going to do get status and I'm going to say get uh, diff. So what are we diffing here? Uh, this is where we're adding linked clones and the cache. So we're doing, going to say get add vagrant file get commit minus m added linked clone setting and cache in settings to speed up built uh, right so oh that was the other thing we need to do so we need to ask vagrant to install that vet plugin so vagrant plugin install vagrant cashier so let's see if this worked it didn't yesterday what's going to happen is it going to work so when i looked at the cashier plugin yesterday it hadn't been updated in several years so oh no it has worked okay excellent so vagrant up first boots always going to be slow because um we are importing the box file uh, into the as the linked clone uh, and then we are um cloning that machine and also the first time we run any apt installed um it's got to install the package caches Oh, we appear to have had a crash then. That's that's not good. Let's not send that for right now because this is a virtual machine. And they're probably not going to like what it is we're doing, is it anyway? Um, right. So we're importing this base box. So as I said, this is going to be a bit slower the first time, and should go a bit faster in the future. There we go. So we still have to wait for the virtual box to boot. So in fact, let's just pop this up here. So this is our linked clone up here. Um, all of our subsequent machines are going to be base stuff. So like, in fact, it even says the word base there. And there's our running machine. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to show that running machine just to give you an idea. As to what's going on inside it, which we can't see. In fact, I appear to have just crashed my session. That's annoying. You may have to bear with me one moment. Oh no, there we go, it's booting. Excellent. So this is what a Linux box looks like when it's booting. Uh, you have all the stuff turned off when you got when you boot a desktop system, but this is all the stuff that goes on inside the machine. Uh, goodness me, what a lot of stuff it's checking.
So this part here is actually mirrored every few seconds over in this image up here. Oh, goodness me, what have I done? Uh, maybe that's it. Nope. I do, in fact, appear to have just killed my, uh, my ability to make changes inside that virtual machine. So let me uh, let me see if I can tweak that. Uh, let me see if I can kill that. Is that going to kill that? Yes, it's killed that. Fantastic. Right. So we're still waiting for that virtual box to uh, to finish booting. So I guess what we could actually be doing is we could be watching this cloud console. Maybe that tell me where we're up to. Yes. It's actually showing me there. I could have just looked at that rather than going into that boot session. That's annoying. I'll know that for next time. So, I close that back down. So, oh, very interesting. Okie dokie. So, what has it done? So let's just talk about this for a second. So it's finished booting, all the good stuff there. Uh, and then it has mounted these two paths. So we're gonna make use of this in a second. Um, this first path here, slash vagrant, um, is actually, so anyone that knows any Ubuntu, or in fact Linux file systems, knows that you don't typically have a root directory called vagrant. But what vagrant does, it actually creates this directory and mounts the home, the directory that you're running the virtual, the vagrant box from inside it. So that's useful. And the other thing that we've got here is we've got temp vagrant cache mounted for here. So what this means is that any in package installs we do from here on out, the packages will actually be stored there. Good stuff. So, uh, and in fact, if I have a quick look in Oh, no, that's actually in the mine fast. Right. So, if I vagrant SSH, uh, and do ls vagrant minus L, you'll actually see there's our vagrant file there, and there's our um, log file that we can see there. And if I do uh, ls minus la, you can also see dot get, dot get ignore, and dot vagrant. Fantastic. So, what do we want to do next? Well, a virtual machine is only as useful as the stuff you have running inside it. So, uh, here we have this SC block here. So, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new part here that says sc dot vm. Sorry. SCO one rather dot vm dot provision shell and we're gonna say the S and I'm gonna say S dot inline equals EF. So 
This little fella here means everything from here, well, from the next line until where we say the word EOF is gonna be something we want you to send to that virtual machine. So if I do echo hello world, save that. What I can now do is I can do vagrant provision. So what Vagrant does in the background is it SSHs into the machine. Uh, it creates this shell script on the machine uh, and then it executes that shell script. So, so far, hopefully, so good. Bum, bum, bum. Excellent, hello world. All good so far. Now, Instead of doing shell, uh, what we can also do instead is we can use Ansible. So let's replace that with Ansible local. Do A. So instead of this inline here, we're going to do A dot playbook equals Ansible dot YAML. So where you have um, either a, um, a file path that is n not a complete file path, it, it basically means run it from the Vagrant directory. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're now gonna create in here an ansible.yaml file. Uh, and all we're gonna have in that ansible.yaml file is we're going to have hosts all uh, gather facts to speed things up false and we're going to have oh, tasks debug message hello from ansible okay so what differences have we got here now? Git status, what does that tell me? It says we've got this vagrant file. Interesting, where's our Ansible file gone? Ah, I've just dropped that into that vagrant directory. That's annoying. Uh, let's move that into there. Ooh. And so get status. Haha, <laughs> so we've got this untracked file called Ansible, and we've got a vagrant file there. So get uh, diff. Oh, interesting. It has only shown the diff of the file it's tracking, this vagrant file. And it says, aha, we've added this here. So let's get a vagrant file. Get diff cached. Excellent, all good so far. And we're going to say get add. Ansible, get diff cached. So now, not only have we got our Vagrant file here that's changed, but we've also got, it says there's a new file here. You can say that, seal that because it's gone from null to Ansible. Uh, and it's got the file we wanted there. So we're gonna say git, so let's not do a git commit first. Let's do Vagrant provision. We're going to ask it to provision itself with that. So in the background, what's going on? Um, Ansible is, sorry, Vagrant is asking Ansible to install some packages to itself. So in fact, what I'll do is I'll set up a side-by-side -side shell and I'll do Vagrant SSH. And we can see here that it's installing Ansible. Now, this isn't being written to the cloud image console, or is it? I don't think it is. No, it's finished. Um, so it isn't writing it to the cloud image console, but what it is doing um, is it's writing some logs to its local machine. So I can do tail minus F minus N. So minus F minus N the zero. Find var log type F 
So tail uh, is a very useful command, particularly when you're looking for logs. So minus F means follow and minus N means starting from zero lines. Uh, so basically the bottom of the file. And then we're running this second command here, which says find in var log all the files of type and hand the results of that back to this tail command. So basically it's saying, look at everything that's in the logging directory. And what we should start to see eventually, that might take a few moments. Is some package logs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell for log dpackage.log. So that's showing the last 10 lines and it's showing that it's installing this man db uh, thing there. So I think that's really the one we're going to particularly want to be watching. But um, if I was to do minus n1, we'd get all of the, we'd get the last line from each of these files here. But the problem is some of these files are binary files, particularly as btmp and this auth.log and these two journal files here. So if we were to cat those, we'd just get blobs of random characters, which isn't that useful to me. I'm just gonna bear, bear with me one second whilst I get my jumper on, cause it's kind of cold in here. There we go. So, We're installing some packages. So this is where it's finishing installing Ansible. Um, the version of Ansible that is in the uh, normal Debian package repository is actually something like um, 2.5 or something like that. So what the um, the Vagrant developers have done is they've actually added a PPA, which is a personal package archive, um, to the uh, to the Ubuntu virtual machines. So basically. If it knows about PPAs, it will try and use the PPA. If it doesn't, it will use the native um, version of uh, Ansible that's in the normal repositories. If it knows it's a Red Hat or Fedora based system, it'll do a yum install or a DNF install or something like that. Um, uh, and so it will use whatever it can basically. Um, so we're nearly at the point where it's finished installing Ansible. Not quite, but we're nearly there. So we've now run our Ansible script. Fantastic. So what we should find, once that's done, so I'm gonna come out of that because we don't need to do that stuff anymore because Ansible is now installed in there. What I am gonna do though is I'm gonna have a look in dot vagrant cache Ubuntu Bionic 64. And what we'll find, what we should find in here is apt. So here's all of the packages that it's installed since that that box is installed. So this basically means all these packages we had to wait for it to download before it doesn't need to anymore. And if we have a look in apt lists, we can see here's all of the um, package files that it's pulled from those locations as well. So what have we done now? We've done Ansible, we've done Vagrant, we've done Ubuntu, we've done Shell Script. Well, actually, we're going to use that Shell Script paradigm a little bit more. So let's come out of that one because we don't need that one anymore. I'm going to drop that back down there. I'm going to come back to our Vagrant file. So we've got our Ansible thing here. The next thing that I mentioned we wanted to do. So Ansible, right. So just to sort of wind things back just a sm smidge. Um, Vagrant's useful what to give you a command line, oh, sorry, a, a text file that defines how your virtual machine should be built. 
VirtualBox is your hypervisor, your system that runs your virtual machines for you. Um, plugins extend the capabilities of Vagrant. Um, your virtual machine has a provider, which in this case is VirtualBox. So again, we're talking to that VirtualBox provider to issue commands inside Vagrant and to actually run your virtual machine for you. Virtual machine is basically a pretend physical computer. Uh, then we're using Ansible uh, to deploy packages in there. There is a version of this that is Ansible without the minus local, underscore local, but that uses an installation of Ansible on your local machine. And if you're using a Windows machine, then obviously you can't run Ansible local. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is I want to use Inspec. Now, Inspec is a way of checking that the configured virtual machine looks like what you're expecting it to look like. So what I need to do is I need to run a shell script. Now I could do this with Ansible, but I want to show you the two different, the fact that you can have multiple different provisioners here. So I'm going to do sco1.vm dot provision. Uh, and I'm going to say shell do uh, s. Uh, this is just a convention to do s or whatever. Um, so you could equally do shell. Uh, and then do end. So I can then do uh, shell dot inline equals EOF. Right. So I have got this line here that I'm about to paste into there because it's a bit of a, a wordy one. Uh, I've got this direct from the um, inspect installation guide. Now, uh, for some of those of you that um, are at all information security um, opinionated, uh, we're doing a curl of a URL and we're piping it to bash. This is considered to be a big security no-no because if you don't trust the people, if you don't trust all of the infrastructure in your, in your environment, then you're potentially opening yourself up to um, some security risks. If this was my production system, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, <clears throat> what you should be doing in those situations is actually downloading this file separately, uh, reading it, uh, making sure you're comfortable with all the stuff that's in there, perhaps even pulling the script apart and dropping the individual package parts into your virtual machine yourself. Um, I, however, am doing this as a proof of concept just to show you how this stuff works. So I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so, um, what I will say though is uh, consider using uh, curl um, no, the way you get and confirming the script does what you <clears throat> does what you want. So, but we're asking this to run. So what this line here will do is this will actually um, install Inspec. All good. Now, Inspec uh, has a an end user license agreement. Um, as this is for my personal use, um, this is not for business use. I am able to accept the end user license agreement. If you're a business, uh, the end user license agreement explicitly says you cannot use this for business use without contacting us first. So if you are going to use Inspec, you need to go away and uh, obtain a license. Um, however, that doesn't really work very well for automatically provisioning machines. Uh, so yeah, so if you were to just run Inspec at that point, uh, what it would actually do is it would say, um, uh, please confirm you're, you're happy to uh, proceed and you'd have to say yes. Uh, but what you can do instead is you can do chef minus license equals accept silent nothing output to dev null to output to dev no and I'm just going to comment there as well this is for personal use only accept Euler for yourself first okay so this is setting up inspect Ooh, hang on. 
Uh, did we actually finish our git commit there? Git status. Uh, git dev. Ah, haven't saved that bit right. So, um, oh, good point here. So, if I do a git commit at the moment, this part up here is the bit that's staged. So it's ready to be added to my git tree. And this bit down here is not staged. So if I do git diff cached, it tells me the bits that I've staged, which is these two lines here. So if I do git commit minus m and say um, add Ansible script uh, to vagrant file for demo, and I'll do get status, the staged bit here, the changes to be committed parts not not there. Uh, but we need to do now uh, get hold. Uh, sorry, get get status even. So we've got our vagrant file here, so it's the get uh, diff. Uh, so that's the lines we're going to be adding. So this is saying we're going to be adding that uh, chef bit. Now the next thing that we need to do is we now need to say that on every run we want to run inspect. So sc provision shall do shall shall dot run always in shell dot inline equals inspect exec vagrant inspect.rb so even though at this point here in fact let's uh, so this part here because it's part of the vagrant ecosystem it knows that this provision command needs to be run against the dot slash vagrant directory um, this part here, this shell script, is not inside, these two shell scripts rather, are not inside the um, the Vagrant part because they're shell scripts running inside the virtual machine. So you need to explicitly call out that it's in the Vagrant directory. So we're going to say end there. And oh, we haven't got this file. So let's create this file now. So uh, let's not do what I did before and have it up in the Vagrant directory because that was a bit embarrassing. Uh, and we'll say this is going to be called inspect.rb. So this is an inspect file. So we're going to do two things. We're going to say describe package. So what packages do we know are actually installed on this machine? So let's say open SSH do. No. And we're going to say it should be, oops, should be installed. So we know that when we look at this, we're saying that the package OpenSSH should be installed. And what else do we need? Well, we also need to say that describe port 22 do it should be listening. End. So what have we got now? Git diff. So we're going to have it installing um, uh, chef, uh, chef inspect rather. In fact, actually what I will do is just because sometimes I want to run this provision. So if I run um, vagrant provision, what it'll do is it'll actually execute all of these provision parts here, um, which is fine for idempotent things like Ansible. Idempotent just means if you run it twice, it will only make changes that need to be made. Whereas a non-idempotent file, like the shell script here, it doesn't know about any, whether this script's installed on there. So what I'm gonna say is, if, which inspect, Uh, is a zero length string then d 
do this lot. Otherwise, you skip it. So, the witch command on um, Linux Mac systems actually says, which, if I run the command inspect, which command are you going to execute? So what this means is that um, even if we do provision this multiple times, um, where it's only going to run this part once. So let's do save and do vagrant provision. Execute. Ooh. Run. What have I done wrong? Oh, what have I done wrong? Let's have a quick look at the uh, vagrant up provision shall run always. Oh, I know why. Because you can't do that like that. What you have to do is you have to do shell run always. That's why. Let's do that now. Have I done that right now? Let's find out. So even when you're used to doing this stuff, you still always get stuff wrong. Not always, but you still often get stuff wrong. fixed it now. Fantastic. So, interestingly, these cache buckets, because we're doing a curl up here to do our um, inspect install, um, we actually don't get the benefit of the cache buckets for that. It's not a disaster, it's just one of those things, annoyingly. I don't think so, anyway. Oh, well, we'll find out. When I tend to do scripts like this, these uh, these shell commands uh, in more complicated environments, what I'll actually do is um, I'll actually move this stuff into a separate uh, file outside of the Vagrant file um, and then call it. Uh, because what it means that I can do is I can actually call shell scripts with a minus X flag and it shows me each command that's executing. So I actually know what's going on inside there. At the moment, I don't really know what's going on at all. So thank you for installing inspec. Uh, and then after that, we are licensing it. So the reason why we have a little delay here is because it's going away and it's uh, saying, it's telling, uh, I think it's telling chef people that it's actually, uh, it's actually registering itself. <laughs> oh, what's gone wrong? Package open SSH expected that the package open SSH is installed. So <clears throat> what we can see here is that the open SSH package is not installed. But that's odd because I was pretty sure we did. So let's have a look. Vagrant <clears throat> SSH. 
So get back into our SSH session for a second. And the uh, D package minus R. Crap. SSH. Ah, it's because it's called Open SSH Server. That's a bit annoying. So let's go back to our inspect RB and say that should be Open SSH Server. So, what we could do is use sudo, which means um, uh, super user do, or become root to do something, minus i to get an interactive login. So basically it's like doing sudo space minus su space dash or su space dash and then putting a password in if you, for any of those that used to do old fashioned uh, Unix Linuxy stuff. And now we can do inspect exact vagrant in spec RB. And now we've got fixed ourselves. Excellent. So we now have a working virtual machine. So I think more or less we've done everything that I set out to do. So the last thing that I want to do uh, is just do a vagrant destroy minus F to get rid of my virtual machine. Uh, and then once that's finished, uh, we just need to uh, do a git status uh, to see what's changed. So we've got uh, the vagrant file and the inspect RB. Uh, one second then. Let me just. Um, oh, yes, I remember what I was going to do. Uh, so I'm going to do git add vagrant file. Git add inspect RB. Do git diff. Cached. So we've got our shell, we've got our inspect RB. Oh, we've not added comments, we should have added comments. So uh, let's just say what we're going to do here. So um, this starts the Ansible provisioner um, inside the virtual machine. This defines the Ansible playbook to run. And this says um, this starts a shell provision inside the virtual machine. Oh, may as well talk about that while I'm here for a second. Um, interestingly, if we shunt this part here, outside of that virtual machine, and stick it up here instead, change that to config. This means that it will run that same Ansible playbook in any of the virtual machines we configure down here. Um, bum, bum, bum. So, um, this defines the commands we will run. And then this starts a shell provisioner on every boot inside the virtual machine. This is the command to run. So I think we're pretty much good here. So we'll do git and vagrant file, git commit minus f, added comments around provisioning, and added inspect statements. What have I done? Ah, because 
it's not minus F. That's false, you fool. Minus M. So get lock. All good stuff. So, uh, vagrant status. Um, bum, bum, bum. Not created. Excellent. So, what I can now do is I want to make the repository of the source code that I just created here available to you guys. So, I am going to create a git repository. Uh, how's this going to work? I know what I can do. What I'm going to have to do is do this one offline afterwards. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish this to a Git repository, which is going to be at https github.com slash John the nice guy slash screencast zero zero one ansible inspec vagrant so that's where this is going to go and uh, obviously i've not pushed these files up yet but i still need to do that uh, but obviously that means giving my public and private keys up to uh, this server which i don't particularly want to, oh, i know i can i know how i can do this uh, this is pretty That's what I'll do. Um, so let's copy a particular file, which is uh, there we go. to uh, what's this machine called again? it no it's not going to work is it uh, that's what I should have done I need to SFTP this file over. so what I'm going to do is so, so just in case it's not clear this is actually a virtual machine uh, it's a remote desktop machine that I've got set up uh, so I can transfer I can do all this stuff without it being tainted by my local machine but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to SCP SCP SSH my public key to so what I should be able to now do is from my terminal. Uh, so eval SSH agent SSH add. Oops, wrong password. Put a password, and now I can uh, do screencast. Right. So when I created my remote session, my, my new repository rather, um, what it actually did 
because it tells me what I need to do. So I'm going to copy this line here, not that line, because I'm using the get one. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say with that, paste that, and then get push, get push. So what does that do? I'm going to say yes. So this has now pushed my code into here. What does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, we now have our .getignore. We've got our vagrant file, our Ansible YAML, and our inspect RB. And we can see in our logs all of these lovely things here that are my commit logs. So now you, wonderful people out there, can go to this path and see what I did. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to say thank you very much for watching my simple walkthrough of Ansible, Inspect and Vagrant. And I hope this inspires you to go away and start playing with those tools. And hopefully there should be some more of these coming soon in the future. Many thanks. Bye bye.